Our country has never been in more danger of World War III than it is right now. In many ways, the world has been at relative peace for quite a while now, lulling many people in the West into the thought that bad things just can't happen, or certainly they can't happen here. And yet the world is also in a total state of chaos. Things in the world are changing in a big way. Today, we're going to talk about how to protect yourself from changes in the world, whether it's a world war or some other threat to your peace. And the first thing to examine is the idea that people say there's nowhere to go. Today, we're going to examine facts and look at actual data of where you could go. We're going to apply a couple different ways of looking at this. That if a world war were to break out, not only how would you protect yourself physically, but how would you protect yourself geopolitically? And we look at the war between Russia and Ukraine. One day, people in a big country found themselves without access to financial services, without access to get many different dual citizenships or residence permits or many options at all in the countries that a lot of them would have historically gone to to seek more freedom. It was all just cut off overnight. And so beyond just physical safety, we want to look at what's the reputation of your country going to be if there's a war? Where will you be able to go to seek freedom and to seek safety? One commenter said, if World War III takes place in the near future, that could change everything, but there may be no safe place to go. And I went back and looked at data from World War II. There are certainly a lot of deaths that happened obviously uh, in Europe and other places that were around the world. But you look at a country like Brazil, 2,000 deaths, and that was pretty much the only country in South America that was even involved. There were a lot of countries that basically just sat that one out. Now, it's true that a number of countries are becoming more geopolitically involved and militarily involved in what's happening in the world. But if we look at any past war, there are always places where you can go. People get residence permits in countries like Paraguay or Uruguay or even islands like Mauritius in the Indian Ocean because they just wanted to have an option to be away from it all. And if you were ever to become a citizen of that country, you'd make sure that no matter what happened, you had access to go and live there. To me, that's a sane strategy. But let's talk about facts. Since 2008, the level of global peacefulness has deteriorated by about 2%, with 75 countries recording a deterioration, while 86 improved. If you look at some of the Western countries that people say we often pick on, well, we pick on them because they are, in many cases, part of that 75, not part of the 86 that are improving. There are some exceptions to that, and I'll tell you about them. The average level of global peacefulness has deteriorated for nine of the past 13 years, just the world as a whole. Europe remains the most peaceful region in the world, although it has recorded a slight deterioration in peacefulness. Obviously, Europe as a whole is not so peaceful now, and yet... Portugal is a different situation in Ukraine. I think some people like this comment or have this kind of like soothing mechanism where they don't know how to move or don't want to move or think they can't afford to move, which I push back on. And their soothing mechanism is, well, nowhere to be safe. So I might as well just, I'll just do nothing. And, and so like, you're no better than I am. And it really makes them feel better about themselves. And yet is life in Switzerland any worse than it was a couple of years ago? Probably not in a noticeable way. So where should you go? Let's consult some different metrics. The first thing we looked at is what's called the Global Peace Index. This studies countries by their overall level of peacefulness. This speaks to safety. It speaks to some geopolitical issues. Iceland has been number one for 13 years in a row. Now, it's very hard to get citizenship in Iceland. I guess there's ways to get residence, but not really through investment. It'd be more of a thing where you marry an Icelandic person or perhaps get a job there. However, if you have a passport from an EU member state, Iceland is not in the EU, and so you have some of the benefits of that, but you are able to actually go and move there. So for example, I have a Norwegian friend who moved to live in Portugal. Norway is also not the EU and Portugal is, but because of what's called the European Economic Area, uh, he's able to do that. And so if you have an EU passport that can be obtained through citizenship by descent, let's say you have an Irish grandparent or an Italian great grandparent, and they never gave up their Italian citizenship, that could be a way to claim getting Malta citizenship by giving close to a million dollars. That can be done in about 18 months. Getting a residence permit, getting a golden visa. There's a number of ways to do it, and depending on what your timeline is, depending on what your lineage is. Having an EU passport gives you access to Iceland. So we want to think strategically here. Where will we go if World War III happens? Well, having access to a country that you may not be a citizen of isn't the worst thing. And one of the benefits of Europe, but I think a lot of Americans or Australians or Canadians don't entirely understand, is that if you can live in one European country, you can basically live in all of them. And so you have that optionality that Iceland is more detached from the rest of the continent, obviously, as an island. 
than living somewhere on the continent itself. Ice wanted the global peace index number one. Now, other things I looked at were neutrality. So Sweden and Switzerland, for example, are famed for their armed neutralities. Uh, they have not been in a state of war internationally since 1815 and 1814, respectively. Now, of course, Sweden has cozied up with NATO now. Switzerland was obviously a bit more on board with joining in and saying, hey, let's sanction Russians, whereas they've been more neutral historically. So that neutrality is eroding a little bit. You look at a country like Ireland, for example, also an island, uh, which scores relatively highly in some of the safety and global peace index studies, they have historically been neutral. And so if we look again at not only where do you want to go to be physically safe in a world war, but where do you want to go to be geopolitically safe? I'd rather be Irish than American because you're going to have a lot more options as an Irish citizen than you are as an American if certain places say, hey, listen, you guys are on the other side of the coin. Let's say a country like Indonesia, you want to move to Bali. They're on one side of this World War III and it's against the you know U.S., Maybe Bali is a perfectly peaceful and wonderful place to go and be. And Indonesia just said, hey, like, listen, we don't want people who are instigating a world war to come here. Like, you're not eligible for this residence permit or we're canceling your visa-free travel. That's happened before. So neutrality is one of the things you can consider. The third thing to look at is simply let's just count the wars. Sources say that Europe has had no wars fought since World War II. Obviously, that has changed. And uh, the Balkans would like a word to those who've said no wars since World War II. One of the things I look at in a World War III scenario is we know that the United States and probably the, the UK and all this kind of so-called international community that they talk about, which is just this tiny percentage of the world, like 10% of the world's population, if even that, that agrees. The Western countries, like the rest of the world's not part of the international community. Those countries are going to be, of course, on one side. Countries like the US are going to be leading the charge, you know, and, and other their biggest allies are going to follow them. The U.S. has been at as many wars as years that I've been alive. And so you can expect that if there's a war, like, you're going to be in it. Now you can say, hey, no one's going to come to the U.S. or Canada and, like, physically do anything. And obviously, in the modern era, it's a little bit different than World War II. Now there's all kinds of different things, you know, terrorism, for example. Who knows what could happen? I would much rather be in Iceland. I'd much rather be in Argentina. I'd much rather be in Mauritius. I'd much rather be in a lot of places than the United States. Obviously, living in Ardmore, Oklahoma, or living in the bush in Australia is going to be safer than living in New York City or Sydney. And I'm not hoping for anything bad to happen, of course. But if the question is, where am I going to go if World War III breaks out? Well, I'm going to look at a new non-Western system in this world of multipolarity. I'm going to figure out, number one, where a country's neutral. But where am I going to be far away from somewhere where countries start wars? And so... If you look at places in South America, there's been a certain amount of instability in that region. And yet you hear guys like Doug Casey say, yeah, you can live in Argentina. You're just the rich gringo and I don't know, let that guy do what he wants to do. You can go to places like, you know, Paraguay, Uruguay, places in Asia could be advantageous. Most of the countries in the world aren't starting wars, aren't getting involved in wars. If you live in a Western country, you're seeing the news that is catering and speaking to that idea of the international community. And that's all you really think about. The news is not talking about Mauritius. They're talking about their own little bubble. And you think that that's the entire world. And the reality is just be away from where they're having the war. There may not be a war where you're living right now or it may not be affecting you, but it's always good to have a plan B. And one of the things that we do here at Nomad Capitalist is help people who don't actually want to move somewhere figure out how they can create that backup plan for themselves and their families. It starts with having assets somewhere else because when war happens, who knows what happens to the financial system. Have assets in stable places. You've seen centuries of history. People keep their gold in asset havens, for example, and whatever happens where they live, the gold's always there. The crypto on a hardware wallet, the money in the bank account, start by having an asset protection structure and then add residence permits, places where you can go, citizenships, places where you are a welcome citizen. They can't keep you out. And by the way, we saw during the pandemic, if you're a permanent resident or a citizen of many countries, the requirements for tourists didn't apply to you. So you got that leg up on everybody else. When there is something chaotic happening in the world, countries often lock down, not internally necessarily, but hey, we don't want the foreigners to come in while we figure out what's going on. If you have access where they can't keep you out, and especially if you have a passport, let's say in the Caribbean, you've got six different countries you can go to as of right. You have a European Union passport. You may say, hey, well, this country itself isn't going to be great. Well, you know, hey, maybe you qualify for Polish citizenship by descent. Oh, that kind of concerns me. But as a Polish citizen, you could live in Iceland 
for example. You could live in a lot of other places. You want to have a plan B for your assets and you want to have a plan B for your family. It's what we help people put together. You don't just want to get one thing in a vacuum. You want to have a holistic plan that addresses your specific needs because there are a lot of unknown unknowns that come in with this stuff. You certainly don't want to get the wrong passport or the wrong residence or make the wrong investment and now you have some tax issue you've got to deal with. We help people clear up a lot of these misconceptions. Go to nomadcapitalist.com and learn about creating and then executing a holistic plan with us to make sure no matter what happens, war or otherwise, you and your family and your wealth are protected. Where is there no war? What are some of the places that when you look geographically are the safest? I'm just going to give you the list. Where are there no wars right now? Botswana and South Africa. Probably not a place a lot of people are going to go. Not an easy place to get citizenship. Very well run. One of the least corrupt countries in Africa. One of the most successful countries in Africa. I think one of the safest countries in Africa. Probably not at the top of your list, but it is there. No war. Chile. You're down there in southern South America. For me, not the most interesting place to live. They have taken a turn to the left. And yet, you can get residence in Chile. You do not always have to be living in Chile to keep that. It's more expensive than the Latin American countries, but it is down there. And I can tell you, it is more developed than many other Latin American countries in many ways. That's a place where there's no war. Costa Rica no war. In fact, there's a bit of a misconception about the military, but basically you've got a police force that handles the country. So Costa Rica, a country you can get a residence permit. We thought that country was going to be less tax friendly. They're actually keeping it tax friendly. And so they've made the right moves fiscally, but they've also made a country that relies on peace, not that far from North America, if you live in the US or Canada. Mauritius we mentioned, easy enough to get a residence permit. You're out there in the middle of the ocean. Been there. Pretty interesting place. Has a bit of Malaysia vibes for my taste. Kind of Malaysia meets East Africa meets India. Kind of obviously just a Western, you know, more Western kind of move over to the West version of Malaysia. You can buy property there. You can use it as a place to park some money. It's a tax friendly place. It is a World War III friendly place. Now, any of these countries, of course, could take certain sides in a war, but these are countries where there is nothing happening now. Switzerland, of course, residence is uh, something that is available. It's a much more expensive proposition in terms of tax, the cost of living, etc. That's for folks who really want to commit. Panama, obviously historically more tied to the U.S., but what's interesting is watching Latin America detach itself from the U.S. and try to be more neutral and make more deals. In this era of multipolarity, I'm seeing Latin America and we're seeing Africa saying, we're not just going to side with one country. They're saying, why do we just go to the, when the U.S. diplomats come, they just say, don't work with China, don't work with them, don't work with them. We're going to do our country first, right? Americans say America first. That's the thing. Well, we're going to be Panama first. We're going to be Rwanda first. We're going to be whatever first. We're not just going to only deal with the U.S. And they said, that's the U.S.'s only pitch. There's diplomats on the record saying, like, the U.S. comes, they just try and say, don't work with anybody else except us. And the other countries are like, when China comes, like, okay, do what you want. Not a ringing endorsement of China, but these countries are starting to put themselves first. And I think that a greater neutrality is probably not the worst thing. Japan, no war, very cheap real estate, hard to get residents, impossible to get citizenship. Qatar in the Gulf. Some people have some reticence around the Gulf, but quite frankly, no war. Uruguay is on the list. Possible to get a residence permit. What's great about Latin America is even if you just have an income, hey, here's my salary, here's my business income. Okay, here's your residence permit. You don't necessarily have to invest a lot of money as is the case sometimes in Asia. You can just show them that you earn money. And if you have a Western salary, you may make enough even for a more upscale country like Uruguay. You can get a residence permit. And if you want to live there, you can work towards citizenship. People have gone to places like Uruguay uh, after, you know, during and after wars. And they've ended up staying there. Do you know how many people of German and Italian ancestry are living in Uruguay? They say, I'm German, I'm Italian. Oh, four generations ago, Uruguay is a place where you can go and you can be safe. It's a safe place right now. Vietnam is also on the list. Some people would say that's too close to China. Now, here's where I would go. I wouldn't want to be surrounded by the conflict. So Botswana would be off my list for the same reason as it's Switzerland. For me, just the cost of living in Switzerland, you know, waiting for something to happen, it's, it's harder to keep Switzerland in your back pocket if you don't have access to live in Switzerland, i.e. an EU passport. If you can get an EU passport and then just go to Switzerland whenever you want, then, you know, that may work. I wouldn't want to be in a huge population center like Vietnam. I probably would not want to live in a country during a war that was as homogenous as Japan. The Japanese people are lovely. I don't know that you would fit in as well there. I would want to maintain a residence permit in a Gulf country. I think when people think, oh, there's a terrible war going on, 
yes, World War III, will be interesting to see how that plays out compared to World War II. It's a whole different era. But if I'm running a business, I want my business to continue to function. And if my business is set up in a tax favorable place that functions, and that's neutral, and it stays at everyone's business, then I would want to have a golf residence permit. Let's say I set up a company in a golf country. I have my company there in a free zone, for example, and I can always go there. And if that's going to be the safe place, uh, I'll do it. Obviously, some of those countries you know, set up a number of military bases for the U.S. and elsewhere. I would probably prioritize away from a country like Panama that has historically been more friendly with the U.S., and it would leave me with Chile, Mauritius, Costa Rica, and Uruguay. Now, those are all good passports. Chile is turning to the left. Maybe that's not the answer. Uruguay, to me, is furthest away. There's a lot of resources, not a big population. It's all kind of concentrated along the coast. Mauritius is interesting. I would look at Uruguay and Mauritius for getting residents, possibly Costa Rica, because I think that Central America is kind of becoming more neutral and kind of getting into that U.S. system. But to me, Uruguay, Mauritius, and Costa Rica stand as places where I can go and get residence permits. In some cases, I need to invest money, i.e. Mauritius, unless I want to do a more complicated business setup. In other cases, I just need to show, hey, here's a couple thousand dollars a month in income, and I can get a residence permit. I'm generally not going to be given citizenship by naturalization unless I'm living there a good chunk of the time. But I've got tax favorability if I'm living there so I can keep running my business. Most importantly, I think you'll be physically safe. And I think there's a certain neutrality in those countries where you're not going to get dragged into it. And let me tell you, if you are American or Australian or British and you want to go around the world, I'd much rather be Mauritian going around the world. I'd much rather be, you know, Uruguayan. Who hates the Uruguayans? Right? Maybe some jokes are told about them by the neighboring countries. But otherwise, who doesn't like the Uruguayans? Uruguay is a small country that doesn't want to dominate your life. If you live there, you get their tax deal for a number of years. Pretty favorable as a place to live. You live by their rules. And if you become Uruguayan, you can, you'll have a lot more options. I'm looking at this as much as physical safety and being away from things, being at a distance, is having the neutrality and not getting sucked into stuff. Well, any number of different problems that come from a world war could affect me. So I think it's pretty unfortunate. If just the passport you hold means, hey, banks no longer want your money. We've seen that from Russians in the war to Americans who have FATCA. Plenty of banks just say, we don't want you. What do you do with your money now? And it's all fun and games when it's happening to someone else. But what happens if there is a world war and countries start taking sides and fewer countries than before side with your country and now you've got fewer options? So listen, plenty of people are just patriots and I live in my country and I go down with the ship. I want to keep living the life that I have because I don't know that after World War II that the reasons Western countries have gone to war are as noble as perhaps the ones that they used to have. Do I really want to stick around for when the fur starts flying for less than noble reasons? I'd rather be in one of those places and building my optionality.